Ever since the end of the Second World War, uh, about 35 years ago, the United States government has become the largest accumulator, generator, and disseminator of information and news. This occurs because the United States government has financed tens of billions of dollars worth of research and development and an enormous amount of material is generated in these various studies. It also comes about because of the large governmental departments that have existed and some have been added to in these last 40 years. Departments like the Department of Commerce, the Department of Energy, the enormously swollen Department of Defense, and the NASA Space Organization, as well as dozens of other entities. And in beyond that, there are also the activities carried on in the informational sphere by Congress itself. All of the congressional committees that are entrusted with drafting legislation and taking testimony and hearing reports. Now, all of this material adds up to just a torrent of information. So it should be very good news when we hear and when we see that the New York Times has decided to introduce a new feature, which it did very recently, a feature which is called Washington Talk. We can hope that in this feature, we may be able to dip a little bit into all of this enormous output of information that has been coming along and has basically been unsifted for such a long time. Now let me go through the first 10 or so days of this new feature and pick out some of the kinds of items that the Times has found suitable to call to our attention. On November 16th, for example, they had a couple of stories. One was on the political husband is a rarity no longer and discusses this essential issue of what happens when the spouse becomes a male in Washington. They also had an article on polling, which is done almost on a daily basis by the Republican Party, but without any kind of analysis of what are the consequences of such a daily pulse-taking of our population. On November 17th, 
there were another couple of stories which supposedly inform us about what's happening in Washington. There was one story about the appointment of a new man to head the antitrust division of the Federal Trade Commission, a very, very attractive, descriptive presentation of this individual. But it's not mentioned that the individual who selected this appointee is one, the head of the FTC, who only very recently informed us that consumers cherish the freedom to buy defective products. What may we expect from the choice of an appointee? Is this a defective appointee? And then on that same page, we have another crucial item. It's an article titled, Keeping Order on the Egg Line, and tells us what are the breakfast preferences of the various individuals who frequent the congressional dining room on Capitol Hill. Another very valuable piece of information. On November 18th, we get a story. This looks like it may have more substance. It's about the groups that are trying to sway the government's Latin American policy. And lo and behold, we are given a rundown of the very weak liberal organizations and, or and outfits that are trying somehow or other to bring some public interest input into the Latin American policy making of our society. Again, we are struck by the absence of the big guns, the real influence wielders, who are really affecting what is happening in Latin America. On November 19th on the Washington Talk page, we have what you might call a bonanza. We have one article telling us, is Henry Kissinger in power or out of power? And what actually is his role in the State Department? Not in any way informing us that in the wings there are dozens of potential Henry Kissingers waiting to be tapped by the proper appropriate financial interest. Henry Kissinger just happened to be one bright guy at Harvard. Harvard is filled with them. So whether Henry Kissinger has maintained his contacts or not is strictly incidental and only of importance to the pocketbook of Henry Kissinger. At the same time, there's a second item on that page. And this is a little chummy article about name-dropping politics, which tells us about the nicknames that our various congressmen and senators like to adopt. And in this, I'll read a sentence or two. It says, in the congressional directory and in who's who, Robert William Packwood is listed. Today, he goes by the name of Bob Packwood. Well, that's very reassuring. But wouldn't it be more helpful be, be told a really more valuable nickname that Mr. Bob Packwood, that Senator Packwood, is Mr. AT&T and is rushing the AT&T bill of deregulation through the Senate. And we would be nice to hear the nicknames of our other senators and congressmen identified with Fortune 500 countries, companies rather than whether they are Bill, Jack, Tom, or Joe. At the same time, on that same page, we are given still another little item. And with just discreet non-comment, the Times tells us that Senator Baker was able to excise from the congressional record a little conversation in which one of the senators had made an anti-Semitic comment. That gives us a great sense of confidence in the congressional record when they can excise what happened to be said on the floor because it might uh, prove historically embarrassing. On no November 20th, uh, what's going on in Washington treated us to a fairly sizable article on the wife of the Saudi Arabian ambassador to Washington. And we are told that she is actually creating waves in the Middle Eastern community with her openness and frankness and candor. That, too, is a really eye-opening article. On November 21st, we feel that maybe the Times is finally getting into the swing and dealing with some issues that are of some significance. There's an article on lobbying. And in this article, which is, runs to almost half a page, uh, we are told one or two useful facts, that there are now 16,000 lobbyists in Washington. And we're told of two lobbyists who were formerly congressmen who are now handling defense contracts. But basically, it's a very thin article indeed. And it makes us wonder, how is it that the Times didn't dig a little bit deeper into what David Stockman mentioned in his wonderful expose in the current issue of Atlantic Monthly. And I'm quoting David Stockman now, where he says, I'm talking about K Street and all of the interest groups in this town, the community of interest groups. And a little bit later along, 
Later along in the article, Mr. Stockman says, do you realize the greed that came to the forefront? The hogs were really feeding. The greed level, the level of opportunism just got out of control. That didn't seem to appear in the New York Times article. And now on November 23rd, there's another article that could have been an interesting article. It's about a group that went from exile to influence, the Committee on the Present Danger. But we're not told very much about the Committee on the Present Danger, except many of its members who are now occupying high positions in this administration. But the Committee on the Present Danger regards as it dangerous and the security of the nation is affected because we only have 50,000 nuclear warheads. This, of course, shows a certain kind of an imbalance in their sense of what danger is all about. But this is at the same time presented in the Times as a group which is some sort of an embattled outsider. And will it continue to struggle and speak independently when basically its point of view has representation at the various highest levels of our administration? So I think they might serve, save their concern of whether this organization will be able to maintain its significance and voice. And then finally, on November 24th, there is an article which tells us that two former people in the government are struggling mightily to reduce the size of their governmental pensions. They're aghast at how large their pensions are. Now, in this particular instance, one is not going to challenge these individuals, and maybe their pensions are too large, and maybe they are on the gravy train that's mentioned here. But for most of us, and for the mood in Washington, which is slashing the basic survival levels of people, to put in as a major article how people are trying to cut back on their pensions because they think they are too large, this borders very closely on connivance with the sharpest type of survival, anti-survival measures that this society is now presently engaged in. Now, what can we say about this very personalized selection of items of the last 10 days? I might say, however, my sampling is no worse than the ordinary sampling that we find amongst the Times domestic and international correspondents. What we can say, at a very minimum, is forgetting ideology, forgetting bias, forgetting competition, this just doesn't measure up to average decent reporting. At the end of the Second World War, there began to be published a weekly, which was known as I.F. Stone's Weekly. And I mention that here just to indicate what one individual working almost alone with incidental help on occasion could do by ferreting through the mass of information that does come out in Washington, by checking, by examining newspapers, by going to governmental reports, by checking and going back to the people who are mentioned in these reports, and each week producing four pages chock full of information that informed all of us about the military and corporate and political labyrinths that existed in Washington. That one four-page weekly produced essentially by one individual carried more information and more valuable insights and more about the mechanic, me mechanics of government than almost anything we can expect, not only from a one day, but from an entire week of Washington talk, which is produced with all of the resources of one of the greatest media conglomerates can offer. Now, if we were going to suggest and be constructive, which we are trying to be in this particular program, we might suggest that the New York Times pay attention to such things as who are the big law firms in Washington? Who do they represent? What clients do they have? What kind of cases do they handle? And what kinds of interconnections do they have with the government officials? We might ask the Times to check on who are the paid private consultants? Who are their contracts with? What are these contracts? What happens to the reports that these private consultants make, which are financed with government money? And then, in addition 
we might ask, and this could be possibly somewhat embarrassing, we might ask the Times to run a story on the Washington Press Corps itself. Who are these people? What are their ages? What are their gender? What are their race? What are their incomes? Where do they come from? And it would be extremely interesting in this respect to find out those government officials today who come from the media, and in the same sense, those media workers today who come from the government. Now, in this particular case, the New York Times is very, very heavily represented. It has individuals who once were in the government, like Leslie Gelb and William Sapphire, and it has individuals who were once on the New York Times, like Richard Burt, and also like Edwin Dale, who are now occupying high positions. Is this some sort of a newspaper governmental complex that we also ought to look at? And then finally, let me say that if the New York Times wants to reduce all of the significant events that are going on in Washington to Washington chatter and Washington talk, as it seems to be doing, although of course the evidence is not all in and I'm making my judgment on only a couple of weeks' activity, but if this is its intention, then we might say, why don't they go the whole hog and still be useful by giving us a day-by-day -day account of every social event every party, every social function, with the guest lists, so then we ourselves, without the assistance of the New York Times, might then be able to find out who is selling whom, who is peddling what influence, and who is associating with whom. Then I might say we would have some valuable information. Let me conclude this first section by saying all the rest that we have been discussing in this first approximation of what the Washington talk page is about is merely pretense. In the next section, I'll talk about other aspects of pretense. You're sitting there yakking right in my face. I guess I'm going to have to put you in your place. You know, if silence was golden, you couldn't raise a dime Because your mind is on vacation And your mouth is working overtime And it is just such compelling questions which Herb Schiller has posed, which we will attempt to answer in terms of the New York Times as a corporation. The New York Times newspaper is owned by the New York Times Corporation, which is one of the 500 largest industrial corporations in the United States. But who owns the New York Times? The stock is owned primarily by the Sulzberger family, descendants of the founder and original publisher of this paper. Most of the U.S. newspaper and media corporations are family connected. The Sulzberger family includes Arthur Oak Sulzberger, Marion Sulzberger High School, Ruth Sulzberger Holmberg, Judith Sulzberger Levinson, and their mother, Iphigenia Oak Sulzberger, as well. They own 37.88% of the total number of shares. The second largest shareholder is Cowles Communications at 21.65%, then the Reliance Group at 6.41%, Dreyfus Corporation at 2.60%, Weiss, Peck, and Greer at 1.89%, and Manning, Napier, and Advisor at 1.52. Arthur Oatsulksberger is also the chairman and chief executive officer of the New York Times Corporation, and his vice chairman, Sidney Grusom, and the president, Walter Matson, are chief operating officers and also own sizable amounts of New York Times stock. So the entire Sulzberger family and the chief officers of the corporation have a personal interest and the commercial success of the paper. In addition, the New York Times Corporation has, like any hierarchy, two kinds of stock, a Class A stock and a Class B. Class A is what most Times stockholders own, and it has limited voting rights. Only four of the 11 directors are on the board, for example. The Sulzberger family owns more than 70% of the Class B stock, which has full voting rights. So in effect, they control the New York Times policies as well as the company's major financial beneficiaries. 
The Sulzbergers and the chief operating officers, Matson and Grusom, make up six of the 12 corporations' board of directors. Some of them and other directors also sit on the boards of other corporations. What are these corporations and what is their relation to the Times Corp? Nearly half of them are Fortune 500 industrial giants and 11 out of 30 are banks such as Morgan, Bankers Trust, which are major mutual savings trust and investment banks in the United States. Several of the major banks have also involved in hundreds of millions of dollars in loans and investments in South Africa. And in the past 10 years, some have made direct loans to the governments of South Africa and the city of Johannesburg, thus supporting the Pretoria government itself. These are indicated here, J.P. Morgan, Bankers Trust, Bankers Trust once again, American Express, First Boston, Merrill Lynch, and Chem Bank. A few are major defense contractors, Ford, Bethlehem Steel, and IBM, and some are OSHA violators. But the interconnections of the corporate community, this corporate elite with the New York Times Corporation, doesn't stop there. The Morgan Bank is the corporate trustee for its pension plans, it's a transfer agent for its stock, and has credit agreements with some of the regional newspapers affiliated within the corporation itself. Morgan, the Guarantee Trust parent company, and Bankers Trust are also in the top 20 stockholders of many of these corporations with directors as directors. In fact, if you look at the main stockholders and their boards, you will find the same names over and over again. This is called the Interlocking Directorate, a singularly useful control mechanism for the flow of money and the flow of information. An example, Marion Sulzberger High School, member of the New York Times board, is also on the board of Ford Motor Company. And these directors of Ford share the interlocking corporation directorates with over 50 other companies, including Citicorp, Times Mirror, Wells Fargo, the Brookings Institution and Washington Think Tank, Campbell Soup, Bankers Trust, J.P. Morgan, Hewlett Packard, and Philip Morris. This, court, this interlocking directorate it was the subject of a 1978 United States Senate study. The board of directors, according to this study, establishes the basic objectives and the broad policies of a corporation and is responsible for all fiscal matters. In short, the commercial success of a corporation lies with them. Corporate interlocking establishes special channels of communication, which can lead to the destruction of competition preferential treatment in the purchase and supply of goods and financial services, and most importantly, the concentration of undue fiscal power in the hands of a few. This Senate study found that the major U.S. corporations were concentrated in this interlocked pattern, especially at the top, banking, automotive, and telecommunications. The study warned that these interlocking directorates can have a profound effect on businesses' attempts to influence government policies. They can impact on corporate decisions as to the type and quality of products and services marketed. And they have the capability of influencing not just the job conditions with respect to employee rights, but their compensation, their corporate policies, with respect to the environment, social issues, and the possibility of controlling the shape and the direction of the nation's economy. And finally, what effect does this have on the New York Times? Some say nothing. The New York Times is an independent newspaper committed to journalistic excellence with no strings attached. But the way they boast about their readers in their own annual report tells quite a different story. They compare their readership to the Wall Street Journal, to Forbes and Fortune magazines, and to Business Week. And they claim that Times readers in the <coughs> Northeast hold better jobs, professional and managerial at 43%, earn more personal income, $100,000 plus, are better educated, own more securities with portfolios worth from $100,000 to $250,000, 48% of that total. If there is truth in numbers, might these statistics indicate that the New York Times is not only owned by, 
but is also the voice of the corporate elite. There are other kinds of pretensions and pretending that the Times does in addition to its claim that it is covering the Washington information scene. It sometimes pretends that it offers us debate over serious issues. So that, for example, in its News of the Week or News of Review of November 22nd, it had on its second page two-thirds of the page devoted to what it calls a debate. Does NATO really need those missiles? But who were the debaters? One was Richard Pearl, Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Policy, who obviously believes NATO does need those missiles. And the other debater, and this is a surprise, was Mr. McGeorge Bundy, who some of us may remember as the former National Security Advisor to the Presidents Kennedy and Johnson and the presiding major domo of the Bay of Pigs fiasco when we tried to invade Cuba. Mr. McGeorge Bundy happens to disagree on the question of missiles, but not on the fundamental assumption that the world should be run by U.S. force and coercion. There are many kinds of pretensions. The New York Times assumes a lordly stance, but it rests very heavily on pretense. <laughs> You will not be able to plug in, turn on, and cop out. You will not be able to lose yourself on Skag and skip out for beer during commercials because the revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be brought to you by Xerox in four parts without commercial interruptions. The revolution will not show you pictures of Nixon blowing a bugle and leading a charge by John Mitchell, General Abrams, and Spiro Agnew to eat hog moths confiscated from a Harlem sanctuary. The revolution will not be televised. All right, all right. Well done, well, well done.